I first started writing for young audiences when um, an actress friend of mine uh, showed a play for adults that I'd written uh, to uh, a director at the Theatre Centre. And he liked it, and they were looking for a woman to work with the women's group at the Theatre Centre at the time. There were several groups at the Theatre Centre. It was much better funded and much bigger than it is now. And um, they decided that they would like to have me to have an interview, and then they decided that I could be writer for one play for the women's company. And shortly after that, they said, would I um, write, join, and be their resident writer? I think writing for young audiences, it shaped me because I really had to learn the craft that you can't get away with, um, your audience won't let you, in young, young writing for young people, um, get away with um, self-indulgence or um, writing it too long. There's very specific um, boundaries, you've got time limits, you've got to be very careful about um, how much your audience understands. So it's really disciplined writing that you have to do and you have to absolutely know your audience and um, what they're interested in, how much they will tolerate, um, what things will um, spark them. So it's, it's kind of like going to writing school doing that because if you don't get it right, your audience will pay no attention at all. Um, and they're a kind of forced audience in that, you know, they're told to there's a play in school, sit down there and listen to it. It's not like a, an adult audience or an audience out in kind of commercial theatre or repertory theatre where they've paid their money, they've got an investment in being here. Um, a young audience, a school's audience, have been told to be here and so they don't like it, they don't pay attention. Um, so basically you have to get it right or it'll fail. I was at the Theatre Centre for I think it was two years after, after we did the play um, for the women's group um, Inside Out which was for um, lower secondaries that that went hugely well and we thought you know, we'll carry on with this relationship and um, I was working at that point with Brenda Hughes who then left Theatre Centre to go and run what for TIE um, so I then worked with Noma Shepherd at the Theatre Centre and we kind of co-created a production um, of a play about um, apartheid in South Africa, seen through the eyes of a young um, football supporter, a young female football supporter living in Crossroads Squatter Camp. Um, and the, the access point to her story um, was by an English sports reporter who goes there to cover a, a big match. Um, so you see through the eyes of this white English um, reporter, like we may be watching her, we then go and we see her life in, and her relationship with this woman um, in apart then apartheid South Africa. Um, and we did use lots and lots of original songs, um, freedom songs, and they sang them in South African. Um, and that went from, it not only played into schools, it then had a further life playing at Drill Hall um, in, in central London. Um, in, in tandem with another piece, um, and that that played all that's played all over the place. In fact, it played in Canada and Toronto and, and um, various other places in America as well. And what was that called? That's called Under Exposure. Uh -huh. um, and then after that, I left Theatre Centre and oh no, I wrote one more play about the miners' strike. That's right, um, uh, which was happening at the time. So we were in eighty two, eighty three, um, and I went out and researched with. Um, I went and visited um, striking miners um, all over the country, up in Nottingham and um, Derbyshire and then down to Kent. And one of the things that I think happened throughout my time at the Theatre Centre, apart from writing, was being politicised. Um, I, I just had a sort of total immersion in just thinking politically and being becoming an active political person. And being part of what was an incredible generosity from miners and their wives, particularly their wives, um, of just telling me their stories. And I've made friends that I've stayed with friends with ever since. I don't know whether young people's theatre necessitates being political, but you ha certainly have to be aware of the realities of one's world, which I suppose is being political, because whether you take action or not, I suppose people think about being political being you go out and do something about it. Um, and I have to say, I go on fewer demos now than I did in those days. But um, I think you do have to be political because 
the work is funded and that depends on who's running the Arts Council budget at the time um, and the schools have got different uh, criteria which they have to f fill and fit in their curriculum demands um, and whether they can actually afford to have any theatre coming into their schools. If the EVAC happens as it's said to be going now, then there won't be any drama or art or design coming into schools. So, you know, that will be just lost to another entire generation. So, I think, yes, answering what you just said to me, I think, yes, you do have to be political because otherwise you're going to be marginalised and you won't have any work. The people who influenced me at in my work with young people, I, when I went to the Theatre Centre, David Holman was, was their sort of chief writer and had been for some time, and he's a wonderful, wonderful and acclaimed writer all over the world for young people. Um, and he was hugely supportive and he, he um, supported me in getting grants to write plays and things like that, as well as just kind of you know, coming to see stuff and going, how about doing it this way? Designers and musicians that I worked for, Andrew Dodge was a, an MD as a musical director on um, Stanford Chatting, which I wrote for um, Watford Palace Theatre and Education Company, um, who I worked with subsequently, um, who taught me the power of using music uh, in, in theatre and how unaccompanied song can be one of the most beautiful and, and potent things. Um, and I think the, but the principal person, I think, um, has to be Gwenda Hughes, because she had joined Theatre Centre about a year before I did, she was the one who read my play and um, then said, this woman makes me laugh, let's get her in. Um, and then she went to Watford and then asked me to come to Watford and commission me to write something chatting and singing home there. Um, which, bizarrely enough, of all the theatre plays that I've written, it's the one that's made me the most money because it's done all over, it's done all over the States a lot which was kind of never in anybody's mind when we were writing it and it was just one of those, wow, isn't that amazing, sort of things. And Wendra and I, I mean that was in 1983 that we met and we're still really close and we still work on plays together. So that's been a lifelong sort of theatrical marriage and a crucially important relationship in that I'm quite known to bring up Wendra and go, what do I want to write about next? She'll tell me. <laughs> and uh, she'll also as I have told other directors that they don't have permission to do, but when they has, which happened, I think, during Stamping and Shouting in Watford, I went in one day and she said, oh, I've cut this scene, and I went, oh, um, and she said, well, it was boring, and I went, oh, okay, because I absolutely trusted, and she trusted me, that we were both good at what we did, um, and that we both had the same view in mind, which was to make it the best play possible. So once you've got that trust um, with a relationship, and for writers I think the most important relationship is with the director. Um, that's something very, very precious, and if you ever find somebody, speaking to all young writers or new writers now, that you have that relationship with, nurture it, because mm -hmm. they don't come along often. The difference between writing for young audiences in the 80s, which is when I started, and then writing 30 years on, basically, um, is there's far far less funding, um, although the centre pays properly, all credit to it, it um, invests in new writing and that is what you need to do if you want good people and you want good plays, you um, pay properly and you give proper time to the development of plays, which the theatre centre um, and um, Natalie at the head of it principally kind of focusing that is that you get given a proper amount of time to write stuff and development with schools. I don't recall we did too much work in schools prior to our taking them out. Um, there were people who knew about what was going into the schools um, and there were people who'd researched it and gone in before us, but in terms of doing tryouts with young audiences, that was new to me. I think that collaboration with young people is something that's, that's that has that is that is new since the eighties. Yes, I might I might be maligning it and my memory might look, I might have done this and just forgotten it. But it felt <laughs> time has passed. Um, but it does it it does feel like that's something very new. And also there is uh, there is a real um, engagement with those audiences, uh, the, or the the young people we've been into schools to work with with, with um, theatre centre now. One of the, one of the ways that I've worked with theatre centre recently when, when we wrote. Um, the day the waters came was to go in right at the beginning and ask young people 
does this character interest you, does this idea interest you, and, and judge which way they were going to jump, whether they were in the slightest bit interested or not, to do a workshop. Then to go back further on in the process, um, and when there was this kind of like a near in the final draft, um, and to try it out with actors, with, with um, young audiences, and then rewrite uh, as a result of that. Um, and the directness and the honestness of their response, and also their, I, was, I was impressed with their theatrical language. Um, and the level of, of teaching that they've had in order to be able to understand the ways that you can dramatically produce something. Because uh, quite often we work with, with drama groups and they're really quite sophisticated in their understanding of theatre, considering how little theatre there is out there for young people, um, which is a, you know, a credit to their teaching, I guess. Um, and, and inspiring and really nice to have their, their response. It gives you a confidence that, no, 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 we're all you know, um, reading from the same page. Mm -hmm. The inspiration for plays come from all over the place, but a lot of them come from, I think most of mine come from real life. Um, they come from documentaries, from television programmes, from newspaper articles, from books from people you know, talking about stuff that has actually happened to them. I think that's my starting point. Um, and I research things a lot, really, really thoroughly, because it gives me confidence that I know what I'm talking about. Because apart from, I think, my first play, the, and a, a little bit of other ones, really, um, everything I write is not about me. I mean, I will be part of it, and my experience will be part of it, but everything else is about something I don't know about, so I have to go and find out about it. Um, and for instance, the day the waters came, that was um, started off by watching a documentary, a, um, sometime after the hurricane had happened, a British documentary. So, and then it went down one of my little list of, of ideas to, to pitch to Natalie about what I'd like to write, like to write a play about. Um, and that was the one that, that, that buzzed. So that's the way we went with it, and then read um, a lot of books or a lot of movies about it, went to see some plays that have already been written about it. Um, and then, out of all of that material, themes begin to emerge. Um, and they may be a visual theme, it may be a music type theme, it may be a kind of, a, usually it's something to do with rhythm. Um, and then I will start to find out how my principal characters need to be, um, and how many, whether I will be going with multiple character, or whether, which, which sort of the, the, the style of which I'm going to tell you, who's going to be my storyteller for young people particularly, because that's the access point through from, from how we take this great big thing, like for instance, you know, a hurricane and all the people in New Orleans, and feed it through to you, sitting in your school, who knows a bit off the news, but that's about it. Um, so that's, who that person is, 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 is kind, of, kind of crucial. Yes, it was, it was, it was kind of finding, finding the, 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 the subject that really, really interested me, and then during the research, particularly for instance with the Spike Lee film, there were just people telling their stories in such a vibrant way. There was one, there was one that got me more than any of the others, I think. There was two. There was a lady going into her house and she just, her son was taking her and it basically wasn't there anymore. It had just fallen down and she just stood on the doorstep and said, oh my, oh my. And then she got inside and she broke down. But it was that, oh my, that you just go, I, I understand how you feel. And that's, I suppose, at the core of a lot of what I when I want to write for young people, or anybody, is I want you to understand what this feels like um, to be a person here, to have had this experience, um, to be this afraid of whatever. Um, and um, the, other mo the other moment when I was watching the Spike Lee that told me that there was something, it's almost like a scent in the air that you get to know that there's, there's a story here, it's a sniff. It must be like, like you hear a journalist talking about smell a really good story and it's, it's, there's sort of that feeling it gets physical um, was when those two white women standing on a patch of um, what was sort of like hardcore that had been their house, their home they were quite cross they had the beer cans in their hands um, and the one who said this is all that's left of my home and then she said well here was this and here was the stairs and she said and you, you know, the, the staircase went up here and there was no staircase and she went mind your head and she ducked her head. She was so in the moment of where she was in her house. And I thought, that's how we can do that. We have to do somebody. And that actually is totally in the, in, in, in the play. Was just that 
I can imagine. I am imagining my whole, my whole home. And it was like, that's what you do when you do plays, particularly if you don't have lots of money. Um, you basically go, here's a house, mind your head. And that's, that's sort of what it's about, that the whole audience goes, oh yes, I was mind my head. In order for, for a play to be, to, to create a world for um, an audience where you haven't got big sets and everything else, what you have got is very occasional, a little bit of lighting, you've possibly got sound, but really your main asset is, is your actors. And they're going to create your world. I and mean, it's not a new option. I mean, Shakespeare did it with the, you know, the think of the Henry V speeches about, you know, I'm going to create a world and there's wooden O here for you. And that's sort of what I learnt doing that at the theatre center when I first started off. And I've never stopped in my adult plays like that as well. Because I'm, I'm so not interested in what the sets are. You should get trapped by those. And it's kind of what one's doing is, it's a, it's a phrase that's, that, that's, that's used in adult theatre, which is the suspension of disbelief. In other words, I am going to go with you and I'm going to go, okay, I know we're not really in New Orleans, but I'm going to go along with the idea that we are. And when you say, oh, look, this is my street, and you can hear the sounds, I'm going to buy into that and start to do that. The actors give you the clues, they set you little triggers um, to do with rhythm as much as anything else, to do and, and to do with the emotion of what they're doing. Um, that paint pictures for you, and some of it's verbal and some of it's their physical response. Um, but they're eminently capable of creating an entire world for you, and I think that's even more magical for an audience because it's, it's different in each person's head. So that's why it's you're really crucial as a member of that audience because you're creating your own picture for yourself and it will not be the same as anybody else's. But at the same time, you're part of a collective group of people who are all buying this whole vision, you're looking at a picture and, and it can all be slightly different but the feelings that are happening within it will be ones that you share um, and how people share and experience feelings is what we have common to anybody in the world anywhere at any time in history um, and, and that's one of our access ways that we can understand what it might feel like to, to be alive in Elizabeth in England or in a hurricane in New Orleans if we've never been you know, further you know, west than Devon. Your top tip? Top tip, don't underestimate your audience. I think would be principle. Keep them in the forefront of your mind and give them an access person they can relate to. One of your characters needs to be somebody that, not necessarily of their age, but nearish to their age or their aspiration, because it's somebody that they will then pay attention to who holds them by the hand and, and leads them through your story.